welcome to Health Matters on Channels Television. Thank you for joining us. I am Mary Alale Yusu. Sickle cell disease, the most common group of inherited disorders in the world, causes red blood cells to be misshapen and break down. These cells then interconnect and can result in blood clots. It is estimated by the World Health Organization that each year, over 300,000 babies with severe forms of these diseases are born worldwide. Three quarters of cases occur in Africa. In Nigeria, two out of every 100 children is born with sickle cell disease. Without care and intervention, the majority of children with the most severe form of the disease die before the age of five. I'm being joined by the national director as well as chief executive officer of the Sickle Cell Foundation Nigeria, Dr. Annette Akinshete, is also a public health physician. You're welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you. Let's start with the symptoms of sickle cell disease. What does it look like, especially in the very little people who haven't started talking? Okay, in babies and infants. In infants. Okay, first, let, let's take it like this. Um, when, when a baby's born, there's no difference between a baby who has sickle cell, clinically, when you look at them, and one who does not have sickle cell. You just see a bouncing baby girl, a bouncing baby boy. There's no difference. And then the usual tests that we even have to, t to check for genotype, let me call it genotype. I know you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, those tests don't tell you in a newborn if that child has sickle cell. There are special cells, tests that tell you. So there'll be no symptoms and signs whatsoever in a newborn till about the age of seven months, eight months, thereabouts, nine months to a year. Those that, that's when you get the, the earliest symptoms and signs. And those are what? Swelling of the top of the hands and swelling of the top of the head. We call that hand-foot syndrome. Those are the earliest signs you get. Of course, you just said it, the, the babies don't talk, they can't complain. But there are mothers that will come and tell in the hospital, ah, doctor, my child does not sleep. And then you look at the child, the child is screaming. And if a child is fair skinned, you can even see that the sw swollen top of the hand is reddish, which speaks to inflammation. So those are the earliest signs you will get. So in other words, in a newborn, you won't get any signs and symptoms. And the reason is this, Mary, I'm sure you know now, is that in utero, when the child, when the baby's in the womb, the kind of hemoglobin, which is a culprit in sickle cell, that they have is called hemoglobin F, F for fetus. And that hemoglobin F is just as efficient as hemoglobin A, which is, which is well, how we designate the usual, the normal hemoglobin, hemoglobin A. So hemoglobin F tides them through those first few months of life. And they, come, they don't have any symptoms or signs until their genetic makeup begins to throw up their hemoglobin S, then S begins to cause all those problems that you see. So the earliest symptoms and, or sign will be the swollen top of the hand and swollen top of the foot. Painful. Child is always crying. It's called hand-foot syndrome. That's what the mother will tell you when they come to you. Those are the earliest symptoms. Or so signs. what happens as they grow older? As they grow older, then what usually happens is they're prone to infections. So you see the, ch the parents coming to you at the hospital and the, what worries us the most, quite frankly, is what we call um, acute, acute chest syndrome. Acute chest syndrome is really something that happens to children and pediatricians will tell mothers or parents or caregivers that if your child who has sickle cell develops a fever, do not treat that child like any other child. Please rush to the hospital. In acute chest syndrome, the child is unable to breathe. His breathing, you, you can see labored breathing. And um, you, it, many times I've heard pediatricians describe that the child is at death's door. Is at death's door. And what causes this infection? So the problems that they get are infection. And that's why we worry. What, one of the things we say, and we're talking, engaging with government right now, is we must have newborn screening. Because with newborn screening, you can determine in, in a unit, first month of life, whether the child has sickle cell or not, and you begin to intervene um, prophylactically with um, antibiotics, with um, immunizations, special immunizations that prevent those, those uh, infections, like pneumococcal, that, like you know, Mary, that tend to cause uh, morbidity 
and mortality, you know, sickness and death amongst them, so they don't get to the age of five. Okay, um, let's quickly move to treatment. Exactly. How, how do you treat these conditions? You know, you've spoken about a pyramid of care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to start I've, from somewhere from there, in the middle. Somewhere in the middle of <laughs> or near the bottom. How do you treat, you know, these conditions? Okay, you know something we talked about this year was when we're celebrating World Sickle Cell Day. We felt that, look, but, but part of the things is, the theme is, the broad theme is shine, shine the, the light, light sickle on sickle cell. cell. And it's on all aspects of sickle cell, all aspects. Prevention, treatment, care, support, cure. And um, to debunk all those myths and misconceptions about sickle cell. And that also includes shining light on treatment. Remember that sickle cell, patients with sickle cell, persons with sickle cell, we don't want to call them patients except they're ill, That's can right. live normal, productive lives, long, normal, productive lives, and, and, and contribute meaningfully to the society and to their communities as long as they're properly managed, as long as they're properly treated. And what is the treatment? There's simple things that you can do. Um, what we call routine medications, routine drugs, like folic acid, folate. Folic acid is something you must take every day. And what it does, it helps them shore up their blood levels. You remember the blood cells, the red blood cells in persons with sickle cell, those they mischief break down, they break die down early. so early. Between the last, you remember our, our guest lecturer, yes. our keynote speaker in a recent public lecture, said sometimes as early as five days. Five days. That's five days to, you know, and compare with, uh, a normal red blood cell that lasts three 120 months. 120 days. Well, three months, you know, the difference is so much. So they're turning over so rapidly. And that's and what, what the folate that's helps. That's what help, folate sure. helps you do. Uh, any cells that uh, reproduce rapidly that we need to replace um, frequently, folic acid will help you to do that. So, and it's simple, it's inexpensive. It, it's simple to take and it's inexpensive. You have it in syrup, syrup form, you have it in tablet form. So that's one routine medication. And we give our patients all of this free in, in our center. And, all, and we know we have um, um, specialized dedicated sickle cell, dedicated sickle cell clinics That's embedded right. in state hospitals. You know, and that model is fantastic because you're not running any parallel clinic. That's right. And anyway, that's by the way. So routine medications also include, in our environment, uh, prophylactic anti-malarials. But not the Sunday, Sunday type that we used to take when we were younger. It's every day. It's called pro -guardia. Every day? Every day. Every day. You take folic acid every day. You take... Um, Proguanil every day, and that prevents malaria because you do not want them to have malaria at yes, all. Yes, that could be very devastating. As, as a public health person, I talk about different levels of prevention. Many, tell you, many uh, persons will tell you, prevent sickle cell from happening in the first place. Okay, you can do that. But what if it has happened and patients do have it? Then you must prevent complications from happening. There's another level of prevention, the secondary prevention. And that is so important in, um, amongst these um, group of pe people we're talking about. When they already have sickle, sickle cell disease, you must prevent uh, complications from setting in, and this usually is infection. In any case, we're talking about anemia, that's the hallmark of the condition, shortage of blood. You know, Yorubas actually have uh, improved in their terminology of, um, of sickle cell. They don't call it aromoligo anymore. They now call it sejedole. Okay. Tends to, makes the blood lazy. Mm. It speaks, that speaks to the shortage of blood no, yes. and weakness and anemia. It speaks to the anemia of, of the disease. Mm. So you deal with anemia, you deal with infections. That's Those a secondary the, level of care. And that's secondary because they're preventing complications from occurring. There's so many complications that can happen when you don't treat them like this. You they know, really we, we spoke about uh, self-care. Absolutely. Now, shine and light. Yeah. Shine light on what and you can do. It's very important for, yourself. for them to know how to take care of themselves. Exactly. Can a, a person who has sickle cell disease take care of himself, herself, to such a point that they don't have to visit the hospital? Impossible. It's not possible. There's so much they can do for themselves at home. These are the do's. Little children, four or five years old, will tell you, ah, doctor or mommy, as they call me sometimes, I have my umbrella, I have my rim boots. And, this, and this, it's not raining yet, but she's preparing because they must, not, you know, they must avoid extremes of temperature. Okay, Around so now when it's raining, now. yes, exactly. Around now that's a rainy season, for us it's a cold season. So they're prepared, they must not be in the rain and when to, to get cold. Ext avoid extremes of temperature. So those are the don'ts. Not too hot, not, not too, too hot, cold. not too cold. And it was properly explained at a public lecture that in, um, in cold seasons, your blood vessels kind of shrink. Yes. And if it shrink, it means that those bishopin blood cells will Have more readily less space clog to pass. Will more readily clog the vessels yes. and prevent blood from reaching 
the end organs. And when blood doesn't get there, it means the oxygen that's not getting there. And then that's, that's triggers them um, the crisis. So, so what we're we talking about, we're talking about all this, uh, how to, what are the do's and, and do's, what the things they can the do for themselves. Avoid, avoid those avoid. triggers. Avoid those triggers. Avoid being in an air conditioned room for too long. That, that, that's for those who can even afford it. Okay, but it also, we, we get children from private schools who say that their, air, their classrooms are air conditioned. But you see, treatment of sickle cell is not a one person thing. In the family, is a whole family. In the school, is a whole it's school. The In whole the class, school. it's the teacher and all, the, all, the, all of the classmates. So you see them, and um, it's beautiful to see how people work together. If you, I've spoken with children in, um, who are in, in class with, other, with children with sickle cell, and they turn off, they say they turn off their air conditioners from time to time. I think because awareness of, is increasing. Absolutely. Because of their, their friend or their colleague who has sickle cell. Are there any triggers that are unavoidable? Things you, 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 you cannot just have uh, um, any control any over. Control they will over. tell you, those who have, the, who, like, like um, our advocate spoke about the other day at the lecture, she says they know where the shoe pinch is. Mm -hmm. but we can only tell them so much, but they know where the shoe pinch is. They say sometimes they're doing nothing. They've done nothing at all, but the crisis come. But then in retrospect, when they look back, they can say, OK, I was under stress, emotional stress, okay. mental stress. She talked about examinations. They have to study. She says that when they have to study and they study too long and they don't sleep, they don't sleep as long. And you get the normally. anxiety also. And she talked about anxiety. So we, we can say they're avoidable, but at the same time, but you have to live life. Life is life. You have it to happens. study for examinations. So you have to just stay up with your mates sometimes. You know. Okay. So the, the ones that are avoidable, you must avoid. So those main triggers, infection, prevent them. Extremes of temperature, extreme cold, and extreme heat. Extreme heat you know, causes dehydration, and when you're dehydrated, the blood doesn't flow really. Remember also drinking plenty of water. water. Yes. And they say as much as, not even, you don't, don't wait until you're thirsty. Up to three liters. Up to three liters. You take three liters of wow. water a day, I doubt. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when that challenge was thrown at all of us during the lecture, we all looked at one We're another. We're looking at each other. That's great. Three liters, that's a lot. That's a lot. But I, like I told the young people also have apps on their phones. Yes. And tell the doctor, I have an app. It tells me when to drink my water. Oh, that's so whether a good I'm thirsty thing too. Or not. It's technology is remarkable. Reminds you know, them when to take water. Exactly. Thirsty or not. Now, now they talk about some sort of um, premonition. Some of them have. Aura. Some say yes, an aura. aura. Something they know when they're it's... about to have a crisis. And you know where, why that happens? Why? Because they've studied themselves. That happens with, you know, when over a period of time, over years of knowing yourself. So that's what all the counselors also tell them. Know yourself. Understand when you think it's coming, they know when it's coming. Okay, some, some will tell you that when they have itching of the skin, they know it's come itching, and I wonder why. But well, that's, that's his or her own or trigger. Herself. So, so they, they know. When we come back from the break, you, you tell me what do they do when they get those, those auras. Okay, but what to do about it? After the break. Okay. Please stay with us, we're coming shortly. Welcome back, we're talking about sickle cell disease with Dr. Annette Akinchete on Channels Television. Two out of every 100 children born has sickle cell disease. Now, back to the questions. Um, we were talking about that aura yeah. that happens. What does a person do when they feel that aura coming? Okay, it's different. It varies from person to person, as you can imagine. Some tell you that it's, um, they feel a certain kind of heat around them. But in any case, the most important thing is recognize it. Mm -hmm. So once you recognize it, and they tell you once you recognize it, what do they do? They take plenty of water immediately. Sometimes some say they, they have a warm shower or soak themselves in a warm, uh, in warm water, in a um, tub of warm water. But take plenty of water. And then they take pain medication. Because so at there's the end of time it, it, to it, it means it's not always so. But they, they have seen that when they do that, the outcome is better. Okay. When they do that, the outcome is better. In, in other words, what... Let's define outcome. Maybe that normally the crisis would last three, four days. This time it will last maybe a couple of days, two days, or so thereabouts. Well, so the thing is, a lot is better. To re <laughs> recognize it. Take, they take plenty of water. They take the painkillers, the pain medication. But and then they do what they can while they can at home. And if you don't get any better, they see the doctor. Okay. Uh, in uh, for asthmatics, mm -hmm. sometimes they get better. They say they don't have um, uh, the aura. They do, they, they've not even had an attack, an asthmatic attack, okay, okay. for years. And then, suddenly, and then suddenly it comes. And some of them are caught napping. 
they don't have their inhaler. What is it that someone with sickle cell disease must not be caught without? Fantastic. I, I, I was on a, on a podcast with a, a young lady, a young lady who has sickle, sickle cell. Um, she, she also calls herself a champion. And I said, yeah, that's it. I prefer, I prefer the term. She said to me, and I said, you know, what I've come to see is that persons who have sickle cell, persons who have diabetes, persons with chronic conditions in my body, I can talk about sickle cell and diabetes, be friends with them, make friends with them, because their bags are full of all sorts of things. They have pain medication, they have water, they have creams, they have name it. So I when you say, what should they be caught with that, uh, not, not napping? Mm -hmm. Pain medication, just okay. over-the-counter types. I remember also that one pediatrician at a public lecture said that um, normally um, physicians would prescribe three times daily and said, no, no, no. Those medications, the, the um, over-the-counter, I can say paracetamol is a generic, yes, generic, generic name, name. okay? It should be taken four to six hourly. Four to six hourly. So don't wait for the pain don't, to don't, become bad. No, and then so if they get the aura, they take it. And take it four to six hourly. Don't take it three times a day. Three times a day means like you're dividing your day into eight hours. That's right. And so, and so eight hours is by, too by that time, the pain is coming back up again. Remember that the pain of sickle cell is indeed very severe, as indeed our advocate spoke yes. to that day. And then, like I've mentioned before, women who have had labor, who have had children, who have been in labor, compare both and say that labor pain, labor pain is child's play compared with pain from sickle cell. That is really saying something. You can that say is really that, that saying kind of something. It helps you, you know, quantify gauge it. it. Gauge it. So, because you can't really, you can only sympathize, you can't empathize. You don't know how, where the shoe pinches. The pain is severe. Or for those who sometimes say, um, the consult, consultants who say, oh, well, tell me where your pain is on the scale of one to 10. One being the least. And they probably say the 20. Least. Exactly. <laughs> it's through, your skill doesn't do it. Your skill doesn't do it. It goes me. through the roof. So, so the hallmark of sickle cell is that pain. And of course, the anemia, the shortage of blood, those two things. And of course, people tell you, like I said, we're shining light on also the myths and misconceptions. That's a state that is a death sentence. It is not a death sentence. Of course, it's not um, a walk in the park. Hmm? But it is not a death sentence. And those things, who have lived to be... 70, into 80. their seventies yes. and into their nineties. Yes. What have they said that's been their helped secret? them? What was their secret? Yes. Many times they tell is water. Those I've asked because I've asked those questions of all the older people. Is this is water? They take plenty of water. That's clinically. But more again, remember our advocate saying that you have to accept it. Yes. So living it is also uh, living your life through the, going through the pain, but also living a life. You have a life to live, so you live that life. Accept it, deal with it, and then um, be, be sure that you see your doctor regularly at least twice a year. Those are the things that they tell us that they do. Okay, let's talk about that apex of the pyramid. Okay. That's the cure. Why is that apex? Why is it so thin? Why is, why is it this, the apex? Why is it the apex? Okay, again, I always speak from wearing my hat as a public health person. As a public health person, I want to make sure that I give I ensure there's the, a, a, the most care for the most people. That's why I speak of that pyramid. The base of the pyramid is all those routine medications, the folic acid, the progranil, take plenty of water, know your do's and don'ts, see your doctor regularly, all those things, that are counseling. And don't forget also to prevent, by preventing complications. That's right. Be sure that they get the antibiotics and the immunizations and so on. Fine. So we can do well with all that. But the apex is that at the top. It's, um, by that I mean the cure for sickle cell. And luckily, I think we've been blessed at Sickle Cell Foundation Nigeria that this year, January this year, the, the governor of Lagos State officially opened our bone marrow transplant center. Bone marrow transplantation is a cure for sickle cell as we know it today. There are many others, some others, I can't say many others, that are still experimental, including what you know, as, uh, as we know, as, as um, gene therapy. Gene editing. By gene editing, gene therapy, but that is still, those are still experimental. The apex, as I put it today, is just this bone marrow or stem cell, stem cell transplantation. It is not available to everybody. Number one is the cost. The cost is a barrier. It's the first barrier is expensive. But the doc doctors who do it also are very selective about the persons that they um, 
to vote as exactly. a candidate. So not everyone is a good candidate for, for bone marrow transplantation. Because it has its own risks. It has its own downsides. Remember, you're going to do what they call ablation. They remove the patient's own bone marrow That's right. so that the, the marrow is prepared to receive the, the, marrow, marrow. the marrow that is now supposed to you know, proliferate and begin to produce AA cells or AS cells, depending on the donor. So the, the way of the pros and cons, there are boxes to check. Indeed, how many crises a year does this patient have? Should I leave this patient well alone? Because he has one crisis in three, Anything to in three years. The odds. Exactly. So the way they pros and cons is not everybody that's a good candidate for bone marrow transplantation. And as much as um, it has been very good and helpful, uh, we're, we're in the in the scheme of things, and we might talk about timing. For how many years have we done um, bone marrow transplantation globally? I think it's um, twenty. 30 years most globally globally so, so it's still it's, it's relatively still, new exactly so you say what so we say okay, what are the long 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 term um, complications that might ensue so people still have to even be watching for those exactly however it is a cure I, and I those am those to know somebody exactly. and they tell who you has had one it's like day and night or like night and day that the difference in their lifestyle is so much is so much but counseling is key but i think i've shared with you about a patient who felt for goodness sake, I prefer being in my old body as someone who has sickle cell to this new to life. This new and life. why? Because he felt he wasn't get, getting the care the attention. and attention that he used to. <laughs> so they need to be properly counseled. That's just on a lighter note. But it is a cure for sickle cell indeed. All right, Dr. Kinshete, thank you so much for coming to the show. This has really been... And I hope everybody is watching because and two listening. out of 100, that means most people know someone who has this condition and then our children in of course you've said that nigeria has the highest burden 150,000 babies are born every year every year in nigeria and that's like half of all the children born in the world with sickle cell that's so we right. have this so we should be in the forefront of this um, fight against them thank you so much for thank coming you. it's been thank a pleasure much. having you as you thank you very much mary for having me thank you for watching i hope you've picked a thing or two for our six all our six have a wonderful day i am mary alale yusuf